All right. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Mathieu Gorge. Good Irish name, as you can see. Um, VG Trust um, is a company that specializes in helping organizations achieve and maintain compliance uh, with various industry and legal standards. And of course, we, we have to look at the cloud. Um, so what I'm going to do over the, the next uh, little while is I'm going to provide you with some information about PCI itself, the evolution of PCI, and why PCI is spending a lot of time on the cloud in terms of the implications of moving data that has to do with credit card holder onto the cloud. I'll provide you with, um, with some information uh, on, on who we are and our own security model. I'll update you from a global, European, uh, UK and Irish perspective. Um, I'll spend most of the time talking about the, the cloud perspectives from, from a PCI perspective. Um, I also need to talk about the evolution of payment platforms because that kind of links into the cloud as well and it links into the, the security. So um, VG Trust is based in Dublin. We have an office in, in New York and I was, uh, I was paying a lot of attention earlier on to, to the com comments about um, moving data to the US. So uh, we, we've had the office in New York for the last uh, three or four years. Last year we opened up in London and in Paris. And um, we spent a lot of time helping our US customers understand the EU data protection framework and then also uh, helping um, uh, uh, European customers understand what I call the lack of uh, privacy and data protection regulations in, in the US. But I think one thing that's interesting, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in a few minutes, is the, the convergence between the two frameworks, whereby in the EU we've been saying, well, we need to protect the information. We need to have, you know, we've got those eight principles and to protect and the information acquired the right way and destructed the right way and so on. Uh, use what's known as appropriate security measures to, to protect the information. But we don't really have, um, we don't really have a, a standard for, for looking at what happens if something goes wrong. And that's where data protection comes in. Whereas in the US, they, they did it the other way. They, they now have data protection uh, notification laws in 48 states. Some of them are very strong, some of them are not so strong. Um, there's talk of a federal one coming in, so it's going to level off. The stronger ones are going to be weakened, and the weaker ones are going to be uh, a, a little bit more uh, strong. But what we're seeing is in Massachusetts, for instance, there's MA201 since April 2010. And MA201 is really a carbon copy of the Data Protection Act. It does require you to train your employees. It requires you to have policies and procedures, to have the right technical information protected by the right firewalls, antivirus, and so on. So we're seeing that convergence. And I think the cloud is also helping deal with that. Um, this is our own model, and, and that applies to cloud and on-premise information. If you try to demystify security, you look at PCI, HIPAA, FSA in the UK, all of that good stuff, um, you can identify five common denominators, and that's physical security, people security, data security, which is the central pillar, IT security, which covers infrastructure and cloud, and then uh, Paul spoke about that, disaster recovery and business continuity, crisis management, what happens when something goes wrong. So um, what we do to help our uh, uh, customers is we, we provide services around that based on our five pillars, and we provide a suite of services. We've got an e-learning um, portfolio of about 25 modules co covering corporate governance compliance. We've got a, an offering around the PCI for merchant aggregators, allowing them to push out a compliance validation portal and education portal to their merchants, and we also have an, an enterprise solution. Um, Enisa was mentioned earlier on. Um, I have some recommended reading on, on cloud from Enisa. You'll get the links in the, in the presentations. We also do a lot of work with uh, the, the Compliance Authority. Um, more recently, uh, we've been engaging with the East-West Institute. Uh, if you guys don't know the East-West East Institute uh, cyber crime uh, and cyber security uh, initiative, you need to, to look it up. Uh, I've been working with them for the last four years. Um, essentially, they also look at cloud, they look at business continuity from the, the, the government perspective. So what keeps me up at night is not really the Patriot Act, uh, although I, I am somewhat concerned about it, uh, but what keeps me up at night right now is uh, critical infrastructure protection. 
And in fact, um, from an Irish perspective, um, there hasn't been any major audit done of any of the critical infrastructure protection in Ireland, whether it's cyber, physical, water, ATMs, and so on. And I think we distinctly need, as Ireland Inc., to lobby the government to do that. Uh, I'm also, for my sins, the chairman of um, uh, Info Security Ireland, which is the, uh, the, the platform from the Irish government that um, promotes Ireland Inc. as a center of expertise on the global uh, scene. Uh, and there's uh, six founding members, uh, some of which are in, are in the room. Uh, but basically what we're doing is we've met with Minister Bruton on a couple of occasions. We are calling for the government to appoint a, a chief security officer to advise the government departments not to leave memory keys on trains or on the Lewis and that type of stuff. Uh, but also uh, what we want to do is we want to get a, a a spokesman or a spokeswoman for the government uh, in terms of security uh, in Ireland. And uh, I appreciate that the Irish government has uh, bigger problems right now, but um, I, I believe that if you, look, if, you, if you forget the tactical issues, if you look at the strategic issues uh, in terms of security and cyber threats and so on, we really need Ireland Inc. to do this. Uh, and so, uh, on, on another note, if you guys want to get involved in Info Security Ireland, to talk to me afterwards. Um, I can't talk at a security conference this year without talking about the elephant in the room. And in fact, the elephant in the room was mentioned by, by Andy and by Paul. And it's about managing your third parties and understanding that whatever happens, whether it's for payment card in industry related data or any type of data, you are ultimately, ultimately responsible for the data that, that, that you have. And that was seen with the, uh, the Epsilon bridge in the US. Uh, of course, I'm going to have to mention the, the one that I get the most mileage out of this year, which is Sony. Uh, I mean, Sony couldn't have done any better for any security professional speaking at conferences this year, and we use them all the time. Um, what, what really drove me crazy about Sony is that an organization of 160,000 people did not have a chief security officer until three months after they got breached. Uh, and that, that, is, that is an issue. Um, Paul mentioned Facebook. Um, I'll speak about Facebook uh, again. Um, I believe that the latest figures are that they have about 800 million users. Uh, one of the other interesting facts about Facebook is that um, they have actually published a number of average minutes per returning user per, per, per month. So if you divide that by the number of users, you get about 23 or 24 hours. So I guarantee you that those 23 or 24 hours are not spent at the weekend. They're spent on your time. Uh, and so there's a cost and there's a security implication on that. In terms of the payments industry, um, this is a definition that I took from CyberSource uh, and their annual uh, security report. So it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to read it very quickly. Payment security entails managing and securing payment data across an organization's full order life cycle from point of acceptance through fraud management, fulfillment, customer service, funding, financial reconciliation, transaction record storage, presence of payment data at any of these points, whether on organization systems, networks are visible to staff, exposes the organization to risk. Great. So what does it exactly mean? Um, it means that we need to manage that information. It's by securing the data throughout the life cycle from point to point, whether it's encrypted or not. Uh, talk about fraud, financial reconciliation to make sure that nothing gets lost. Uh, and Paul spoke about that earlier on. There's, there's information going in. Is the information going out? Is, is that the same? And then the issue of storage, and I'll talk about e-discovery again. Um, so the presence of payment data at any of those points, whether on organization systems, networks, or visible to staff, exposes the organization to risk. So really what it, what it means at the end of the day is that the presence of payment data exposes the organization to risk. So if you don't need payment data, don't, don't take it and mostly don't store it. Um, and therefore, you really need to be able to understand your own ecosystem. I always talk about ecosystem diagrams. And people look at me and say, the French-Irish lad has lost it again. But really, what I mean by that is you need to have a network diagram. And when I ask for a network diagram, typically what I get is this, right? Um, 
and uh, it's a blank screen. But really what I want to see is I want to see something that's going to show me your security zones, something that's going to be up to date, that's going to be part of maybe an ISO process or maybe an internal process, whichever way you want to call it. But it has to be um, something that you, you can demonstrate that you're in control of your data. And the idea of controlling the data was mentioned earlier on. Now, if you use a cloud service provider, he, he needs to be in your red security zone because um, even though I do agree with Paul when he says that most cloud providers can probably secure the, the data better than you ever will, at the end of the day, they're, they're not within your environment. So you're trusting, you're entrusting people with stuff that uh, is your, is, it's your business. And there's also legal implications on that. So, um, when, you, when you create your network diagram, your ecosystem diagram, you really need to make sure that, that you include your cloud provider. And then for each zone, you end up with a, with a dedicated network diagram uh, and ideally a data flow diagram that says this is the data, this is where it's coming from, this is who I'm acquiring it from, this is who I'm holding it for, this is how I destruct it, this, and so on and so on. So, uh, moving on to PCI, I think the 2010-2011, the we're nearly at the end of 11 now, um, uh, period has been a, a very busy time for, for PCI. Um, first of all, it's clear that the US remains the most compliant area um, in terms of geographical spread and adoption rates. Um, however, Europe is gaining traction. And um, in, in 2010, Jeremy King was appointed as European Director for PCI. He's done a very good job at recruiting participating organizations. Uh, and of course, if you either process, store, or transmit credit card data, even though you might be using a payment service provider who themselves might be PCI compliant, you yourselves need to validate your compliance. And um, if you are doing that, I would highly recommend that you become a participating organization of the council uh, because it allows you to get uh, input into the next draft. It also allows you to go to the community meetings, which um, are, are um, very good for networking. They're also uh, very good for learning about the, the technology and where, where things are going. Uh, PCO was updated in October 2010. Um, and so um, the, the life cycle of PCI is a three-year life cycle. But what they do is during those three years, they actually publish guidance papers. They also publish informational uh, supplements that allow you to address new areas such as mobile and cloud. And, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So the papers that came out this year, tokenization, wireless, Virtualization, which is the one that talks about cloud computing, and I'm going to provide you with more information on that, and then mobile. And right now, mobile is very big because payments are going mobile. I don't think it's the end of cash. I don't think it'll be ever the end of cash, but everything is going mobile at the moment. Sorry. Um, in terms of... Um, other developments, Visa TIP, the technology um, uh, program from, from Visa, which is based on the prioritized approach, sorry, yeah, the prioritized approach from, from PCI, allows people that take more than 75% of their uh, transactions through EMV to kind of get an exemption from validating compliance with PCI. But if you read the small print, it doesn't actually exempt you from being PCI compliant. You still need to be PCI compliant. So in the industry, there's and not rumors, actually, uh, at this stage, there are no longer rumors, but there, it's actually proven that the whole idea behind Visa TIP was to force the U.S. to go chip and pin. Right now in the U.S., you go into, um, as, as a good uh, plastic party, what I do when I go to New York is I go to an Irish bar, right? And um, I end up on an Irish bar on 3rd Avenue and I, I order a pint, I give my credit card and I say, would you like to leave it open? Of course I don't, by the way. But um, that's what we do. And your credit card is behind the bar and uh, uh, essentially, um, because there's no chip and pin, anybody can say, oh, that's my card, I want to sign for that. They sign Mickey Mouse and they go away with your card. And um, uh, chip and pin going to the U.S. There's five major banks that have been pushing chip and pin uh, into the U.S. 
uh, the council actually reckons that EMV is not really going to take off in the US, that, that m everything's going to move directly to contactless and NFC and mobile. But it's something to look into because that also has implications for, for the applications that run all of that, most of which are actually based on, on cloud. Um, Paul already spoke about data protection, but I wanted to, to talk about it myself. Uh, I, I already spoke about the eight principles. Um, that figure is actually from the UK. There's been 700 data breaches uh, reported in the last two years. Um, the, in the UK, the ICO has new powers to issue fines. Uh, six fines issued already. Um, I, I argue that the, the UK government uh, fining another four UK governments and uh, that kind of, it's okay, it's leading by example, but it's not really putting the right message out. And then if you look at the, the number of records that have been breached for the two commercial entities that have been fined, you get a, a price per record of three pounds, which is not really providing the right value uh, either. Um, credit card holder data is personal information protected under the DPA. Both the ICO in the UK and the Data Protection, data protection Commissioner uh, in Ireland have been actually saying that as far as they're concerned, um, the EU Data Protection Directive states that if there's an industry standard to protect information, you need to comply with it. So if you're breached um, and you are supposed to be in compliance with PCI and you're not, at the time of the breach, then they'll go, they'll go harder on you. Now, the issue in Ireland is obviously, um, whilst there, there's, there's a legal framework uh, in terms of penalties, they're not really enforced. And until they are enforced, uh, we're not really going to see a, a, a lot of uh, traction there. Um, data breach notification, I spoke about that um, earlier on. There's actually a very good conference coming up uh, on Tuesday in Brussels uh, on data protection where they're going to unveil the, uh, the new data protection directive draft which hopefully will be uh, enacted in, in 2012. And I think data breach notification is going to come in. Uh, in the US, as I said, um, it, it, it's coming in and there's also links to, um, to cloud there. So uh, again, I think I have the links to the NIST guidance on cloud and how that how that links into breach notification uh, later on in the, in the presentation. I also think that in terms of payments industry, there's a threat of government regulation. So we're better off regulating the industry ourselves because at least we have some control. In the US, uh, uh, in fact, that, that's actually gone up. The, there's already PCI legislation in uh, eight states at this stage. Uh, and it's very likely that it will be become federal law in the US within three to five years and then the EU will follow. In fact, the EU might be there ahead of that because it's expected that the new directive draft that's going to come out next week will reference PCI DSS and ISO 27001 rather than just industry regulations. So PCI and the cloud. Um, one of the things that was interesting about uh, PCI this year is that the PCI has a, 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 a board of directors, it's got a board of advisors, it's got executive people, it's also got what's known as security interest groups, uh, SIGs. And the SIG that was responsible for virtualization and cloud was the SIG that's responsible for scoping PCI, i.e. deciding how you can ring fence your environment in the diagrams that, were, that, that I was showing you earlier on. So really they're basically saying the whole idea about moving credit card data into the cloud is how far do you want your environment to stretch? Because PCI states that any network component whether uh, it is a, a physical or a virtual one that transmits, stores, um, or processes credit card holder data is in scope and therefore needs to be protected. So if you move stuff to the cloud, part of that cloud environment is going to become part of your, of your network that's in scope. Now, obviously, the cloud provider also needs to be PCI compliant for the data that they host for you. Um, so this is uh, basically the area uh, from the virtualization guideline that was published this year in, in June. And as you can see here, uh, recommendations for mixed mode environments, I'll talk about that in a minute, recommendations for cloud computing and guidance for assessing risks in virtual environments. So they have about 20 pages on that. Um, 
if you look at the definitions that they provide, they're, they're not too far away from Andy's definitions uh, that, that you heard earlier on this morning. Private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud. They also talk about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, payment as a service, security as a service, uh, and software as a service. Um, so uh, they don't actually currently have any cloud uh, guidance. It's under the virtualization stuff. What it boils down to really is about um, the fact that the, in, as far as the council is, is concerned, um, cloud environments challenges make it nearly impossible for some cloud-based services to operate in a PCI DSS compliant manner. So really you always need to check with your cloud provider whether they are PCI compliant themselves. Um, and also they advise that the cloud provider uh, really provides the right uh, appropriate levels of PCI DSS compliance for your data. So what that means really is that your cardholder data needs to re remain protected and therefore, even though they provide definitions for public cloud and hybrid cloud, they're basically saying stay with a private cloud. Uh, right now they're not, uh, 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 they're not really saying that you can go anywhere else. Um, they, uh, uh, the Tech Target actually, uh, I don't know if you read Tech Target and, and, and searchsecurity.com, I actually wrote a number of articles um, on virtualization and, and the cloud for them with regards to PCI and um, um, the, I suppose the, the conclusion really is that the guidance that, that is available right now from the council is very good if you're moving to the cloud right now, i.e. if you haven't actually moved to the cloud already because the guidance is really good for greenfield sites, but if you've already moved to the cloud and you try to retrofit all of the, the good guidance that's in there, it's going to take you a lot of time. You'd nearly be better off moving from one cloud provider to another, and then you go back to the issues that Paul w was mentioning earlier on, as in, can you get to the data, and when you move the data away from one cloud provider, does some data stay within the first one, and what about uh, business continuity? So, it's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, now, there is a new security interest group on cloud computing that uh, literally is just uh, uh, the, the voting for, sorry, not the, the voting was on three weeks ago and you had until, unfortunately, Wednesday to register for the, the security interest group. But I, I'd say if you, if you send them a, a, an email, I think it's, uh, it's uh, PCI-SIG at uh, PCI-SecurityStandards.org. Um, you can still register for the cloud computing uh, working group. And, and that working group is going to produce new white papers and specific guidance for private cloud. Um, and it's also going to, to uh, uh, probably do a number of webinars uh, available to um, participating organizations. So I guess the, the recommendations for PCI in the cloud are really to scope your environment. So understand your cloud environment is in scope. So just because you're moving to, to cloud doesn't mean that you're shifting the responsibility. I think uh, Andy and Paul made that point very, very clear. The responsibility remains with you. You're still, in, in as far from an Irish perspective, you're still uh, the data controller uh, and your cloud provider becomes a data processor. But at the end of the day, you, you, you need to, to, to take control. Remember that all network components are in scope. So that means that whoever is looking after your information uh, within the cloud provider also needs to be trained under requirement 12.6 of, of PCI. So you need to make sure that they are trained. Now, if your provider is, is PCI compliant, um, they are more than likely uh, training their staff on that. Mapping is key. So remember the, the, the ecosystem diagrams that I, that I, that I gave you earlier on. Uh, when we do, uh, we're not a QSA, by the way. We're not a qualified security assessor. We, we actually partner with, uh, with, with uh, QSAs. But before we bring in the QSAs, when we do a pre-assessment, well, the first thing we ask is, can I see your ecosystem diagrams? Can you demonstrate to me that you master the data flow, especially if you use a third party like a, like a cloud provider? The cloud provider must be in compliance, and uh, that is more or less covered under requirement 12.8. So requ what requirement 12.8 says is that you need to be in control of your third-party providers. It also says that if those third-party providers have themselves 
uh, subcontracted, you need to drill down. But how far will you drill down? Like, for instance, if you use, say, uh, a cloud service from Cisco, uh, Cisco outsource a lot of stuff. You know, so you don't necessarily deal with Cisco themselves. So how far do you drill down? Do you have a security checklist that allows you to say, well, okay, I've drilled down four levels because we believe in our company that drilling down four levels is an appropriate level of risk assessment. I can't tell you what the appropriate level is for you. What I can tell you is that if you use third parties and you only drill down one level, you're definitely missing out on some risk. So your, your risk mapping is not complete. Your risk surface goes beyond one level. It probably goes two or three levels at the very least. Um, beware of the following as well because, you know, virtualization in a mixed mode is dangerous. And one of the things that you need to, to master is the fact that cloud is about virtualizing stuff when you move into a private cloud or a public cloud. And what you need to do is you need to understand that the physical security that you had on one box and you bring four or five of those boxes onto the one virtual box, you need to make sure that information can't go from box one to box two and so on, or from application on box one to, applica to application, from application A to application B and so on. And one of the issues is that the auditors themselves do not necessarily master cloud and virtualization. And that, i that is a, a real issue. So there is an opportunity for you to take control of that and to say, right, I've mapped my environment, I can tell you how many virtualized environments I have, or virtualized applications, and I'm moving from one to the other. And one thing I would definitely advise against, even though the paper says that you can have a mixed mode, is to go for that mixed mode where you end up with a virtualized environment on which you have a mix of credit card holder data and not credit card holder data. Credit card holder data, A, don't keep it if you don't need it. Don't store it. But if you do have to store it, make sure it's encrypted, make sure it's protected the right way, and make sure it's not mixed with data that shouldn't be on the same server, whether it's virtual or physical, on-premise or on the cloud. Um, it's very hard to, to secure cardholder data if, you, if you're new to virtualization and cloud structure, so do get advice on that. Um, and bear in mind that e-discovery is coming up. Uh, e-discovery is very big in the UK, it's very big in the US, uh, and one of the challenges with current cases at the moment with e-discovery is the idea of having data hosted on a cloud provider that uh, maybe might be regulated in, in Australia or in China or in Japan or in the US. And you know, how do you get access to that information in a timely fashion? Because the last thing you want is to say, well, actually, I can't get access to that data because really they won't send it to me. At which stage, somebody is going to say to you, but should you not have thought of that when you signed the contract? Should you not have the right clause for that in your contract? Um, ISO was mentioned earlier on. I think ISO is a good platform to scope any environment, but especially for, for payments. Um, your cloud assets must be included. Now, within ISO, you know that you define your scope, you define the assets within the scope, you have an asset registrar. Oh, hold on, an asset registrar, but that's on the cloud. So how am I going to get the serial number of the, the server that the cloud provider is using? Because really, I should get that from my asset registrar. So I really need to talk with the cloud provider to, to make sure that I've got all of those assets covered. I can then have a risk assessment and a risk treatment plan that, that actually covers my cloud assets as well. And really, it's a continuous thing. It's for continuous compliance. Uh, and continuous compliance in the cloud because it's moving so fast and everything is, is moving to the cloud whether we like it or not. It has to be a, a, an, ongoing, an ongoing thing. So the bottom line is that it's all about managing your data and it's all about managing third parties. And I would highly recommend you go down at least three or four levels. So um, I suppose I'm going to give you my two cents on, on the evolution of payments. Um, there's always new types of payments coming up. Um, checks are definitely going out of fashion, that's for sure. Uh, you know, there's, there's dates, they keep being pushed out, but checks are going away. But I don't think cash will ever go away. I think you're always going to get a little bit of cash. Having said that, prepaid cards are coming in. Um, SEPA is obviously um, 
um, well, it didn't deliver on what he was supposed to de deliver, but it's getting there. It's making payments faster. Uh, but we are now moving to contactless, where you can do a lot of stuff with one single card. And mobile payments are really, really coming. I, I'd hazard a guess uh, that within the next two years, you'll be taking your, your mobile device and you'll be uh, exchanging five euros with me just by tapping. The, the, the technology is here. All of this is in the cloud, right? So, I mean, the security implications are, are, are massive. And we spoke about Facebook earlier on. Um, I was actually delivering some, some Facebook, uh, some social networking training in the UK last week and uh, it, was, it was very interesting because I, I delivered, I, it was a call center and I delivered it to the managers first and then I delivered it to the staff and um, the staff were much younger than the, the managers and I had a show of hands of who's using Facebook and, and it, any type of social networks on their mobile phones. And all the younger crew were saying, oh yeah, sure. I mean, we, we barely use a laptop anyway. We all, everything we do is on the mobile. So if you start doing your payments on the mobile, you also have your Facebook here. That device becomes a major point of failure in your whole financial ecosystem from a personal perspective. And then if that's mixed with business information, you, you really have a problem. The other thing is that the mobiles are being used as a physical or logical terminal for payments. And again, that's why the, the, the PCI Council has started a, a, an interest group on mobile. They've published the first uh, white papers on mobile. They've actually issued three levels of classifications for approving mobile payments uh, and mobile providers. And it's kind of interesting to watch. It's going to be uh, very interesting over the next, uh, the, the next few years. Um, so we spoke about accountability earlier on. Uh, and I think one of the things that we need to watch is uh, the fact that operators are becoming banks because they don't want to miss out on all, on all that, those new technologies. Uh, banks are becoming payment platforms for everything. And um, are we ever going to replace the cards? I don't think we will, but I think that the cards themselves, uh, and if you look at the acquisitions that Visa and MasterCard and Amex are doing at the moment, they're moving into social media, they're moving into mobile operators. It's not by pure fluke that Google acquired a, a, a mobile company. Um, and I think that another thing that's very interesting is, is really uh, the social networks, because they are on the cloud. Um, and the, the final point that I wanted to, to mention is the idea of security and geolocation. Uh, and the, the example that I use a lot is the, the GPS, right? So if you've got a GPS and you've got the option to put your home address on the GPS, right? Don't do that because if somebody steals your car, they'll get to your house faster than you because they have your car and they have your address. And uh, uh, really, if you need the last two miles, if you need directions for the last two miles to your house, you have bigger problems than IT security. <laughs> Um, so, but I think geolocation is really, really big. You look, at, you look at Facebook and you look at the fact that on Facebook you can advertise where you are, uh, even on LinkedIn. Now, for some, you know, if, uh, you look at my job where I literally live in the cloud, <laughs> uh, you know, traveling from, from, uh, from one country to another. Um, maybe for my job it's interesting to say, well, I'm speaking at that conference. Maybe I have no other choice but to do that. But does everybody need to do that? Because, you know, if I'm in New York, I'm obviously not in Dublin. If I'm not in Dublin, I'm not in the Dublin office. And I'm not at home, you know. So I think that the geolocation thing, I'm waiting for the, major, the next major security incident related to geolocation and mobile. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is really moving forward and we really need to, to pay attention to it. So, um, whilst I, I do have some concerns about social networks, I will ironically leave you with my LinkedIn uh, details. Feel free to reach out. This is the, the recommended reading that I'd like to leave you with. Uh, Enisa have published something on cloud computing. It's, it's good. It's a, a good start. NIST have published a version 1.0 of 500 to 93, which is their cloud computing standards. Uh, the next version will probably be better, but it is actually uh, a good start, and I, I'd highly recommend that if you can't sleep at night, read NIST. It's very good. So that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again, Paul, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you.